PowerPoint? Yep, you can go ahead and uh, pull it up. Um, so thanks to everyone who is attending this session. Um, hopefully you all have been missing sports as much as the rest of us have. And uh, well, our presenters today are three students out of uh, my uh, introduction to econometric class. And so they have each taken the tools they have learned in econometrics and applied them to a different sports question. Um, so first up is Jordan Birch. Uh, he is a senior business administration major who is going to graduate in May and then he'll uh, join us for the MBA program for another year. So we'll be happy to keep Jordan around for another year. Um, and we are going to hear his talk on the uh, UEFA, how you say it? Or UEFA, UEFA, UEFA. Yeah. Uh, UEFA Champions League this year. So um, thank you, Jordan. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, like Dr. Campbell said, I did an econometric study on uh, some sport, which was soccer in this case. And my question was how to determine future Champions League success. Need to uh, give a special thanks to Dr. Campbell because uh, he did a lot to help me with running my regressions because I didn't have the software to run them and things of that nature. But anyways, I just would not have been able to do it without you. So I felt like before I got into it, I need to give some special thanks. All right, back to it. So what is UEFA Champions League? The UEFA itself stands for Union of European Football Association. But uh, what it pretty much is, is it's just a tournament that uh, where the best clubs from Europe's top five leagues and some of their smaller leagues compete against each other. And the winner is kind of the king of Europe, who's considered the champion of club soccer in the world. Uh, throughout the presentation, I sometimes refer to it as UCL, which is just UEFA Champions League. Just thought I would clarify that here at the beginning. Uh, the first tournament was uh, happened in 19, 1955, and since then it's just been growing and uh, amassing more popularity and growing in size and things of that nature. The tournament itself uh, works uh, kind of similar to a few American sports tournaments, but there's a, an initial group stage in which four teams compete and the top two teams from each group stage go on to the next round, which is the round of 16 and so forth and so on, like most tournaments. The thing that's kind of special about the Champions League, though, is the way teams qualify for it. Unlike um, the NFL or the MLB or something like that, there's not just a set uh, list of teams that will compete in this each year. You have to qualify by uh, doing well in your domestic soccer league. So, for example, in England, they have the Premier League, teams from the top four teams from the Premier League in the season before are the ones that qualify for the Champions League in the current year. And like I said, it's kind of like the highest level of club football in the world. So it's a very uh, well-respected tournament. Why does it matter? Uh, from an economic standpoint, it brings in a lot of total revenue. Uh, it 2.2 eight billion dollars uh, just in the 2017-18 season in total revenue. That was the most recent statistic I could find. But just a huge economic uh, event, lots of money being uh, traded hands, that kind of thing. And there's also a lot of viewership. As you see uh, here, 480 million viewers worldwide in the most recent Champions League final. And that's compared to like the Super Bowl there's less than 100 million total viewers worldwide. So we, we here in America kind of consider the Super Bowl to be that big TV event that everyone kind of, whole country stops to watch. The Champions League final can kind of be like that, but a little bit on a more international scale. Uh, and I also have some personal reasons for being interested in this. I play for Milligan soccer team, and I'm also a huge fan of uh, professional soccer. Some of the factors that I use to run my regression and do my research was I kind of broke them down into domestic success, uh, UCL um, Champions League success, and average FIFA rating. As you can see, each one has their uh, a couple 
subcategories. So for like domestic success, and all of this is from the year prior, so the season before the season I ran the regression on, because the debt, because that's how the qualification works. It comes from the year prior. But anyways, uh, by the end, uh, I used to have a few more explanatory variables. Some of them kind of dropped out because issues like multicollinearity, things like that. But the ones that by the end of the project, uh, the domestic success was based on goal differential points and wins in the previous domestic season. And then for, I also uh, added the factors of previous Champions League success. So how far a team made it in the tournament the year prior. And then of course the final thing is average FIFA rating. And that's just the uh, popular game FIFA rates teams based on defense, offense, and midfield. And I just took an average of those three numbers and put a uh, average FIFA rating for each team that was in the tournament. The models themselves that I ran to get my results, I of course took an econometric approach and I used what are called logit models. Uh, they're popular in econometrics and they're used by a lot of economists now in modern uh, economics, but uh, they use binary responses and what to kind of put it in layman's terms, you have either you either did it or you didn't. So if you made it to the round of 16, you get a one or a zero. And if like you didn't, you get the zero. If you did, you get the one and so forth. And that that's one way I use um, I was able to use econometrics to kind of uh, see how past uh, success relates to future success. And I added the previous three Champions League seasons as a way to uh, kind of build on and strengthen whatever results I found because I had more data to back it up. The process itself um, was a little bit difficult just because of the nature of soccer and this tournament. It's kind of random. Uh, once you get past the group stages, selections are random. So sometimes really good teams get pitted against other really good teams. So they get knocked out, even though you might would have assumed that they would go farther, things of that nature. But I think that kind of helped me uh, bring into uh, play the theme of the Rise Above Conference, which is revision. I've, my original model turned out a lot different than my revised model because I dropped some variables, finding this out, finding that out, and just using um, results from my models to improve the final model. I won't spend a lot of time on this uh, data description slide, but it's fairly self-explanatory kind of see the um, variables here on the left side and then just normal uh, statistics like mean, maximum, minimum. That kind of stuff is fairly um, self-explanatory. Just to kind of give an example of how to read one of this table, let's go with average FIFA rating, which is the bottom one here. It is my most, uh, explanatory variable. But anyways, you can just kind of see the range at which it operated at. You can see no variance and just things of that nature. Jumping on here. I won't spend much time on this slide either, but it just shows that lots of my variables were correlated with amongst each other. There's high um, correlation between these explanatory variables. But that said, it does kind of make common it is kind of common sense if, that domestic wins and domestic goal differential, domestic point, all that stuff kind of correlates with each other. Just kind of almost goes without saying. Here on to the result, results themselves. This is the predictive, this is a table that kind of shows the my predictions for um, this year's Champions League competition. Uh, there's colors to kind of denote when teams will fall out of the competition. So here, these red sections show teams that make it to it. And then after that, you've got blue showing the teams that make it um, around further. If 
followed by green and then yellow. And here I have stars beside the winner, which my predicted winner was Barcelona Football Club. Like I was saying a few slides ago, I had to do a lot of revision. When the first uh, model that got ran predicted Real Madrid to be the winner. And the, the rest of the data is fairly similar across the board, but the predicted winner changes. And this is because uh, the updated model has round of 16 uh, results the first leg included, whereas this sec the original model does not include that data. So that's why the second model was able to predict it a little bit more um, efficiently. So again, like I said, the original winner was Real Madrid, but then went with more data added to the regression, we found out that the winner would actually be Barcelona. Again, my most explanatory variable is average FIFA rating. And one um, interesting thing I found throughout the study was that goal differential is consistently negative. And the reason that this is kind of interesting, it, it could on, almost become its, a study of its own, but uh, smaller leagues, uh, you'd expect the winners to have higher scores than in the more competitive leagues because there's more good teams in those leagues. And that doesn't mean necessarily that um, just because you have a high goal differential, which is amount of goals you scored versus amount of goals you let in and whatever positive negative, that's the goal differential. So in the better leagues, you would expect smaller goal differentials because the competition's a little bit higher. And these teams are still, um, will go to the Champions League and have good results. Over here. This is just a table and chart that kind of shows um, between the two how much of the predictions were actually correct. Uh, the bold, as it says here, denotes which um, predictions were right. And this uh, table just kind of makes it visual for us. So you can see the red bars are the predictions that we got uh, correct about teams that would not make it to certain rounds. And as you can see, the um, amount of predictions that came true are a lot higher than that, the ones that did not come true. Just kind of um, shows up some of the legitimacy of the predictability model and um, kind of incur it's encouraging because it makes it seem like that the model will be an accurate predictor of the Champions League. Just some final remarks. Talked a lot about Champions League, this, that, and the other, but the tournament itself was postponed following the round of 16 uh, first leg, and it, there's no date decided to when the tournament will start back, but can't really see um, how accurate the prediction model is until the tournament actually takes place. But I encourage all of you to keep an eye out and see if Barcelona does end up becoming the winner. That's all I have. Thank, thank everyone for your time. And um, if you had any questions, I hope you put them in the chat. Yeah. Gordon, will, will you, number one, uh, uh, stop sh screen sharing? And then I think I re can return to the host. And I can't check if there's any uh, questions at this time until I get back. So I'm the host. Let me check that. And, and while you're checking that, Bruce, if, if we were actually all in the room together, uh, at this point, it would normally be customary to give Jordan a round of applause. So if you want to give him a nod or a thumbs up or a, a virtual fist bump, you know, the golf bump, uh, you know, to uh, show some uh, appreciation, he did it. He did great work this semester. Very, uh, very proud of, of him and, and what what they all did. So, um, uh, nice job, Jordan. And Thank you. Uh, well, it looks like it looks like John Will has a, has a good question for you. Um, uh, what did the uh, statistical significance look like for your independent variables? So, did we have uh, good-looking T statistics in there? 
the T statistics were one part of the project that was not ideal. The, but that said, just like I, I try to add about how soccer, the predictability kind of makes it hard to um, hard um, event to predict. So yeah, the T statistics weren't ideal. Yeah. I, can you can you speak a little bit more about the uh, problematic nature of the way they have designed this tournament and the uh, random draw by round that some of the problems that we encountered. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So I touched on it a little bit, but the way the tournament kind of progresses, you progress stage by stage, and once you get out of that group stage, you're either uh, first seed or a second seed like you're the top team from your group or you're the second best team from your group and those two teams are pulled together and then coupled with like a first seeds coupled with the second seeds but it's done completely randomly and sometimes since the group stages are already just teams thrown together randomly you'll have issues where three really good teams are in a group stage with each other and then you'll have one group where you've got like one really big good team and then the second team that wins through isn't quite as big or as um, good of a club necessarily just because of the way the randomness is of the group stage. Didn't mean to interrupt you, just coming to say hello. Keep hello. going. Greetings. Greetings, President Greer, welcome. How are you? We're we're doing great. We've uh we've just finished up our first presentation. Okay. And uh, I just thought I would check in and see who was here and what was going on. Well, well, and and uh, we need to give you the vital info. Uh, Jordan picked uh, his model picked Barcelona to win. Uh, oh. So mm -hmm. hold hold your breath. Or hold my breath. Gotcha. <laughs> Uh, any any other questions floating around out there? David, by the way, your sound is really muted. I don't know if there's a, an adjustment. Uh, and I am having difficulty. If I don't have the host, I can't see the chat. And um, so I just want to make sure that we have those uh, questions answered. Looks like Seth asked a question. Uh, yeah, so um, before before getting the results of your model, um, if you just had a gut instinct, who would you have picked uh, to win? That's a tough question because I'm a Barcelona fan personally, so I would always kind of lean towards picking Barcelona. So that's another reason I was happy with the way the results turned out. But just uh, based off of intuition, I would say either Barcelona or Liverpool would be the two teams that seemed strongest through the first group stages and into the first round of the, the first leg of round 16. It's a good question though. <laughs> Ironically, Liverpool's out of it. Yeah, that's true. So. You wouldn't have imagined a team that has a Barcelona in like a year. Um, mm -hmm. They just lost the wrong game. Yep. That just kind of adds to what I was saying before about sometimes good teams get pitted against a group of other good teams, and then sometimes you'd expect a team to go on through, and they end up losing just because of the way the tournament works out. Yep, yeah, that that was that was what happened with Real Madrid, our initial mm -hmm. champion. Is uh, once we entered the matchups for the round of sixteen, we realized that they were pitted against one of the two teams that were predicted to beat them. They could, yeah, can actually. <laughs> and so, and so they, they pulled it off. Um, well, uh, I want to give a thank you again to Jordan uh, for his excellent work this semester. I think you did a great job on your presentation. Uh, everybody wants to give him one more round of appreciation through a, a nod or a thumbs up or a fist bump or <laughs> soft clap. <laughs> uh, uh, and we will and we will move on to our next presenter, uh, which is is it John Will? Yes. Okay. Um, and I just made you the host, John. John Will. Uh, so John Will Hutchison is a junior uh, at Milligan. He is a swimmer, and uh, he has he was in our swim 
classes, biology and double major, and economics and accounting. And uh, he's a little bit of a baseball fan, and so um, he, his uh, his study is focused on baseball. So um, I hope you all will uh, give him your attention and, and uh, let him tell you what he learned about. All right, thank you, Dr. Campbell. Uh, in true David Campbell fashion, before I start this, I am going to admit my bias. And my bias when it comes to Major League Baseball is I love the Atlanta Braves. So I did not let that influence how I chose statistics or how I ran this model, um, because this is ultimately for the National League East, which has the Braves in it. And that is why I chose to do this. <clears throat> so basically what I did is I decided to study part of Major League Baseball through economics. If I can get this, there it is. So what I did is um, I decided to look at the NL East and uh, obviously Major League Baseball has been one of America's favorite pastimes for many centuries. Uh, families continue to take their kids out to the ballpark to enjoy a good hot dog, the sunshine and good competition. And so um, I'm gonna be using econometrics specifically to evaluate some baseball stuff. And so one of the major reasons that baseball can even be evaluated through economic modeling is that baseball was one of the first industries in which uh, researchers could actually look at incremental contribution of an individual and correlate it with overall company revenue. And so for baseball, this is look at individual baseball statistics from each player correlated with overall wins. And so um, the, basically the basic aim of econometrics is to confront theoretical economics, which we all love our theories in economics, uh, but to confront these with reality, so data, as much as this is possible considering our knowledge of facts. So the objective of this particular study is to use econometric modeling to find a causal relationship between individual baseball statistics and overall wins and use these findings to predict the winner of the National League East Baseball Division. So as far as the parameters of the model go, um, within econometrics there are many different types of models and even more forms of each model. And so I went with the one that we studied the most in class, which is the ordinary least squares model. Um, basically, what this tries to do is it tries to minimize the difference between sample points, which you can see a lot of sample points on your screen right now in the chart, and estimated points, which is what the model spits out. Uh, more specifically, I used a panel regression, and a panel regression was needed because I had five different teams within a division. If I was just trying to evaluate wins based on statistics for one team, I could have just done a regular time series. But since I had five teams, it needs to take all of the statistics from each team into one model, and so I'd use a panel. And so um, since all five teams have been in the division for such a long time, there were no problems when I was collecting the data. That wasn't a factor as it was with Jordans. I can only imagine how difficult that was, but for me it was pretty straightforward once I could find the statistics. And so the time range for this study is between 2000 and 2019, so 20 years of data. Um, and the best way to predict the future within Major League Baseball and regressions is to use past batting and pitching statistics for each team. And so data chosen for this study include about 22 uh, independent variables. I ended up going with less, but some of these variables that I tried were runs batted in, at-bats, hits, home runs, earned run average, strikeouts, pitching, and just, just a ton of them, uh, just a ton. And so... Um, Basically, the model that I ended up using for this study in particular was the one that I thought uh, predicted the best, and that is having the independent variable as wins, and then my deep, or sorry, my dependent variable as wins, and then my independent variables are RBIs, which is runs batted in, uh, batting average, earned run average, and saves. So for those not familiar with baseball, um, I don't know if you guys like baseball or not, but for those not uh, related to baseball, runs batted in refers to the number of runs a team scores. Uh, batting average is how many times a batter hits the ball for every time he gets the chance. So let's say that a batter gets up to bat 10 times and they hit the ball two times, then their batting average would be 0.2. Um, and basically, uh, earned run average refers to the number of runs that each pitcher allows to cross the plate on the opposing team. So how many runs you give up. And then saves refers to the number of times a pitcher goes into the final inning of the game with a lead and retains the lead for a win. So saves ended up actually being a very important part of this uh, study. So an example of the data points that I gathered and used for the model from the Miami Marlins are up here. And this is one of the Marlins uh, new star players for this year. But basically you can see just 20 years of RBIs, averages and everything, they vary um, a good bit. So move on to the data description. So you can see here in the table, um, 
the average is always something that people like to look at. So the average for uh, wins, RBI average, ERA and saves are 80.9, 681.9, 0.256, 4.11, and 41.0 respectively. So uh, something that I thought was interesting when looking at this uh, is that the large discrepancy in the number of runs batted in for each team. If you'll look at the standard deviation um, for RBI is 75.8. So basically what that means is within a given year, uh, the runs batted in for each team could vary by 75.8 on average. So it could be as high as 750 one year and as low as just 600 one year. That's all about all I wanted on this slide. And if you're noticing a trend, I have a player on each slide from each of the five teams. So, for example, this is Max Scherzer. Uh, these are my results. Once I ran there, or once Dr. Campbell ran the regression, because he has the software, uh, the results for wins being dependent on RBI, average, ERA, and saves is as follows. And so this is reported in the standard way for regression to be reported uh, with coefficients in front of the variables and standard errors and parentheses underneath. So um, when you interpret this, uh, basically what it means is that for the 58.858 is my intercept. Um, it's a constant, basically whichever, if you have a team that has zero RBI, no average, no ERA, and no saves, they should win 58 games, which makes absolutely no sense, which is why you need all the other variables. <laughs> so um, if you look at the 0.094 on RBIs, this is a level level regression. So what that means is, uh, if you get one extra RBI, then it should increase wins by 0 0.094. For average, it is a little bit more difficult because average is measured from zero to one. So you could say that if you add one unit of average, it would increase wins by 4.7, but since it never goes above one, that's not really fair to say. Or excuse me, it would subtract wins. That's something that's interesting too. It, it would not add wins. Um, so instead, it's more helpful to say for 0.1, for each 0.1 unit of average added, it decreases total wins by 0 0.047 wins. <clears throat> so if your average goes from 0 0.250 to 0 0.260, decreases wins by 0 0.047. And the sign on average is actually very interesting because it suggests that teams who hit better would actually win less. Um, so that is one of the things about the model that was a little bit funky. Um, obviously, it's helpful to look at the whole picture whole picture when you look at the regression, but it's also helpful to understand how individual variables act within the model. So um, moving on to ERA, that one and saves are very easy to interpret. Uh, for each extra run that the pitchers allow, uh, it would decrease wins by 13.623. For each save that is added, it would increase wins by 0.375. So although this is interesting, uh, the most important part of the regression actually refers to the t-statistics. And so this has more to do with the standard errors below. Uh, a t-statistic is something that tells you whether or not a variable within your regression, so for example, let's use RBI, whether or not RBI is a statistically significant variable. So statistically significant variables should carry more weight than ones that are not statistically significant, and it's really a way of validating your model. So um, in order to calculate the t statistic, what you do is you take your coefficient, so for RBI 0 0.094, and you divide it by the standard error, which is 0 0.006. And so what I'm about to say is a mouthful, but basically for the model at hand with 100 test points, 95 degrees of freedom, the minimum requirement for significance at the 5% two-tailed level is 1.987. And what that basically means is when you take the coefficient divided by the standard error, if it's equal to or greater than 1.987, then that's a good thing. So if we just eyeball this, if we look at RBI, um, that's going to be greater than two. So that one's good. ERA is going to be a giant number. So that one's very significant. Saves is the same way. But if you look at average, uh, 4.7 divided by 46 and a half is not even going to reach one. So um, that's something that's important to look at. Average was not statistically significant within the model, but you might ask, should it even be included in the model? Um, I think it should be though, because the variable is important for predicting. Uh, average is a very big part of uh, measuring how well teams hit. So I decided to leave it in anyway. And uh, basically, if the only hitting statistic that I left in there was RBI, it wouldn't be a faithful representation of each team because RBI, um, Power hitters are better at batting in runs. You know, people like Mark McGuire, for example, from a long time ago, Barry Bonds are power hitters. They would have a lot of RBI, whereas average is also representing those batters who get a lot of singles and doubles and are just pure hitters. So it's a more faithful representation of every team. 
So we're gonna move on to my prediction and you'll get to see it right here. Uh, but before, you know, before I say anything else, the Mets were predicted to win the division based on my model. Um, and so basically the most important part of predicting which team would have the most wins is to look at the active rosters. And so each active roster within the division had anything from 27 to 30 players. So I had to get it where each active roster was 27. And in order to do this, I had to drop a few players. So there is really no perfect way of knowing which player would contribute the least to total wins. So what I did is if I needed to drop a batter, I dropped the batter with the lowest average on the team because it was not a statistically significant variable. And if I needed to drop a pitcher, I dropped the pitcher with the highest ERA because not every pitcher has experienced saving games. A lot of pitchers have zero saves over their career. <clears throat> so if I just said, well, who has zero saves, there would be like seven. So I couldn't drop all seven pitchers. Um, so this can add some selection bias to the model, but it's a necessary evil if I want to do some predicting. So once I had an active roster of 27 players, uh, I took the career averages for ERA, ERA and average. And yes, I did take the career average for average. And then I took a 162 game career average for RBI and saves. And what the 162 game average does is it takes the yearly statistics for each player and converts them into a statistic that would be based on if they played all 162 games. And so this is a way of standardizing statistics that can vary drastically for different players based on the number of years they've been in the league or injuries. So, you know, if you have a player who's been in the league for 15 years, they're gonna have a lot more data points uh, for yearly RBI. Whereas if you have a player who's only been in there two years, it's going to be a lot harder to see what their average RBIs would be. So for the hitters, um, I took the average and ERA, or sorry, for the hitters, I took the average and averaged it and got a team average. And then I took the RBIs and totaled them. And then for the pitchers, I took the ERAs, averaged those, and uh, took the total saves. And then I plugged those numbers into the formula. And this is what I got. I got the Mets as the winners with the Braves in second, uh, the Nationals third, Phillies fourth, and Marlins fifth. Honestly, I'm most confident in my Marlins fifth prediction. That one's pretty consistent. Um, and so, although the number of wins that I predicted are, is not an honest representation of the actual wins that they'll win, because the, the 162 game statistic, although it standardizes it for each team, it inflates the number of wins. So, you know, you're saying the average RBI for a really good hitter would be 100 per season, but that's just not accurate. It's, it's just a way of standardizing it so we can really predict uh, unbiasedly. <clears throat> And so even though the wins are not an honest representation, it's important to note that the Mets, uh, in my prediction, only came in one win ahead of the Braves. So that's really almost too close to call. But like I said, I didn't let my bias influence this, uh, my model or my predictions. I'm sticking with it. The Mets are gonna win the NL East this year. And so honestly, the deciding factor for determining the winner ultimately came down to the pitching. Uh, the Mets added a lot of great pitching this year to their active roster. Their ERA was the lowest of any team, and they had way more saves predicted than any other team. Uh, saves were honestly a big factor. Uh, the Braves had the second most saves, and they came in second. Um, so the model put a lot of emphasis on saves, which uh, is important to note. And it is also an important part of baseball because if you have a lead and you have good pitchers who are going to come in and keep the lead for wins, then you're going to win more games. So it's important to remember that the objective of this particular study was to predict the winner of the NL East. Um, it does not in any way reflect postseason statistics or how the teams will do in the postseason. Uh, for example, last year the Braves won the division and they got knocked out in the first round by the Cardinals, whereas the Nationals secured a wild card spot. They had to play one more game than everybody and they didn't get as much home field advantage and they still went on to win the World Series. So this by no means is saying which team is better. It's just me predicting which team I think is going to win their division. So it's important to note this study is not the only one that predicts the Mets to be the winners. Um, in fact, the PECOTA, P-E-C-O-T-A model, which is an important model for experts within the league, uh, also predicts the Mets as the winner of the NL East. And the only difference between my model and their model is that they have the Braves third and the Nationals second, whereas I have them opposite. So ultimately, even though it can be fun to try and predict winners and losers in the sports world, only time will tell who will live up to the expectations and who will fall victim to complacency. These are the sources I got for my photos and the slides, and I will now open it up for questions. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks, Sean Will. Uh, let's give him a show of appreciation. Uh, uh, whatever, whatever your favorite method is, um, and uh, and we will uh, take some questions uh, if anyone has one. I have a question. 
Yeah, go ahead. You, you named another model, and I, don't, I didn't catch it. The, the model that you talked about the league using or someone uh, using. It was a Pecota, so I'm going to be completely honest. I couldn't figure out what that stood for. But well, if you Google, my, my question isn't what it stands for. My, I, I was just curious if you knew what variables they used that were different than the variables you used. Um, I'm not sure what variables they used, but I would assume that it was more hitting and pitching statistics. Um, their model is much more sophisticated than mine. They actually predicted the actual wins that they think each team would get, whereas mine was more of just a cardinal ranking. Okay. And Heather Vicaro asked a question about uh, related to your prediction section and uh, looking at players uh, on each roster. How many teams could you have to eliminate players from? And how often do these teams trade players back and forth? Um, so in baseball, the rosters constantly change, which is important, which is why it was important to use the active rosters. Um, I believe I had to eliminate players from the Mets um the nationals and the marlins i think the phillies and braves both had 27 players um i believe that the nationals had the most players and i think it was 30. so i tried to keep it as even as i could with pitchers and batters so i think the nationals was the only team i had to eliminate a pitcher from the from the data set but um honestly i think even if i had done it differently it wouldn't have changed the result because i eliminated the least productive from each team <clears throat> so if i had eliminated a more productive player then it probably wouldn't have changed that much but uh as far as trading goes they do trade players a lot it, it happens a lot um i was looking at the braves roster and there were a few people on there that i had no idea who they were because they weren't the same as last year thanks john well um Jordan has a, a question of, of maybe more general interest. You might probably come across in your research. Uh, what are Major League Baseball's plans to uh, restart the season or uh, play a season this year? They are still planning to play the season, I believe. The, the last thing I heard is that they might postpone the start. Um, they're trying to start as soon as they can. Uh, I know that they canceled the rest of the preseason a long time ago, and uh, that's when people we're starting to do their predict predictions. Um, but I know that they're still trying to play the season. And <clears throat> I would assume with it being a spring sport, it didn't start, it wouldn't have started until the end of April anyway. So I definitely think that they might have um, some form of shortened season, which could affect uh, standings a little bit, but they're definitely still gonna have the season. All right, and we have a question from Bennett. Uh, how much of a difference do you think it would be if uh, Bryce Harper had stayed in place? Um, I don't think it would have changed who would win the division. Uh, I definitely think that it might have put, well, actually, now that I think about it, the Braves and the Mets were really, they were far ahead of every other team. Um, my wins were inflated, but they were about 30 wins ahead of every other team, which is an inflated number. So I would say it was probably more like 10 ahead of each other team. So, um, Honestly, I don't think it would have made a difference. I think it would have made the standings the same because the Nationals were already ahead of the Phillies and he only helps the Phillies. So it may have made the Nationals a more secure third place team, but it wouldn't have changed the standing. <clears throat> and a question from Seth, uh, why did you use 20 years of data? Um, wouldn't there be significant shifts in the rosters uh, of players over that time period? That is a very good question. Uh, the rosters are completely different from the previous 20 years. So um, the reason that I use 20 years is because the model co is trying to figure out how each independent variable, so RBI and saves and stuff like that, how it correlates with wins. So the more data that I have, basically the better my model is at predicting. Um, so the reason that I use 20 years is because I wanted to have as much data as I could. And 20 years is where Major League Baseball statistics really start to become uh, publicly available. Um, I used my reference. I think I put it in my photo slide uh, for sources. I'm not quite sure, but I know in my paper I reference it. I use um, I use the website called ba Baseball Reference, and it had just tons of statistics for each team. And really the, the best representation started in the year 2000. But yes, uh, we to answer love. your question better, I would have used more. If it started in 1990, I would have went from 1990 to now. I always want to use as many statistics as I can. 
more more is always better when you're talking about mm -hmm. um uh one more i uh, got another question from bennett um how do you think factoring in the farm system and pulling in triple a players could affect the model i definitely think that that affected my model a little bit the only thing the only problem that i had was with this uh was one of the Phillies players, I believe. One Phillies player had no previous MLB data. And so I just did the best that I could with him. I pulled um, the, the highest level of professional baseball that he had played. I pulled his averages from that. But he was the only person who was on active rosters that had never played before. And honestly, I don't think one player makes that big of a difference, uh, especially for the Phillies, because they were pretty safely in fourth place. So um, it could it could affect it. I know last year the Braves pulled Austin Riley, a good hitter up from the farm system, and he contributed a lot, but then he got hurt. So, you know, all of these things are factors. You never know who's going to get injured and who's going to stay healthy, who's going to have a good season, who's going to have a bad season. So um, it definitely could skew my model a little bit. Uh, a question for me. You mentioned the um, margin was very close between the uh, Mets and the Braves. For first place, how how wide was the margin from the Braves to the Nats? Um, I can pull that up really quickly, but I do believe that it was about. Um, like I said, my wins were inflated. So usually, the wins for the NL East are around ninety to ninety-five for the first place team, and my model had you know one hundred and twenty-three for the Mets because I was using that one sixty-two game statistic. But there was no real way to get. Uh, career averages for RBIs and saves unless I use that because it was just too different between di different players. Some players have been in the league for 15 years. Some have only been in for two years. So if I take the averages, it's really not a fair representation. So what I got is the Nationals were 28 games behind the Braves. So I would compare that to about eight games behind the Braves. I would take the 20 off. Asking for my family, who are all big Nats fans. So. Yeah. Well, like I said, the team. Nationals, hey, the Nationals are the defending champions, so I can't say anything until they're knocked out. But <laughs> it's just what my model predicts. And that's ultimately, me and Dr. Campbell talked about this, that's ultimately why I went with a cardinal ranking system, because uh, the way that I had to structure it really was not a good representation of actual wins. Well, John Will, I want to thank you for all the work you put into it uh, this semester and for your uh, presentation today. So if everyone will join me and uh, showing appreciation to him one more time through a thumbs up or through a golf clap. Um, well done, sir. Um, thank you. And uh, our third presenter today um, is uh, Seth Nickel. Um, so Seth is a senior at Milligan. Uh, he's on the uh, track and cross country team. Um, Seth is a double major in economics and applied finance and accounting. Uh, he, he is going to have the uh, unique um, uh, superlative of being the last million student to major in applied finance and accounting. <laughs> that major is going away. Um, he, uh, he is also working for Siemens and will probably be working for them full time following graduation. So, um, uh, I will let Seth go ahead and present his paper. Yeah, and uh, that job with Siemens is why I'm the only presenter not wearing a tie right now. All of my uh, ties are stuck in the dorm room in Johnson City. Um, I would like to make a request ahead of time that if you're in a place that doesn't have a lot of background noise, if you could unmute, because I just don't want to feel like I'm speaking into the void. I don't mind a little chuckle here or there. So just just a request um, today I'm gonna talk to you guys about March Madness and uh, for me uh, March Madness is my favorite time of the year it's my Christmas I love watching 16 games a day on that first weekend and then eight games on that Saturday and Sunday um, I mean Jordan's on the uh, soccer team and wrote about soccer and uh, I'm on the track team and wrote about basketball but I mean I just love all sports so 
to get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about my methodology. I only used the previous three seasons of data, uh, that being that if March Madness were to have happened this year, um, the people that were freshmen in my first season of collected data would be seniors. Um, and I just thought that would be nice because basketball is a constantly shifting sport. And most of the more recent trends were kind of starting to take effect in 2016, 2017, about that time. Um, I used 68 teams from 2020 in my model. Um, obviously, the NCAA selection committee did not release their teams. So insert Walter White voice here. I am the committee. Um, and I used per game statistics on my econometric model. Uh, the reason for that being there are no standardized schedule links, and especially when teams play con uh, conference tournaments, some teams play as many as 35 or 36 games, and some teams play as few as 28 or 29 games. So I chose to use per game stats. I could have also used more advanced stats like per 100 possessions or per 40 minutes, but um, some of the initial tests I ran that way didn't show any drastic differences than per game statistics. And also there aren't very many overtime games to begin with. So I chose to use per game stats. Um, in this model, my dependent variable was my estimated tournament wins. Um, for example, the three teams below, North Carolina in 2017, Villanova in 2018, and Virginia in 2019, won six games in the tournament. The runners, the runners up won five, the final four teams won four, and so on, working all the way down to one. Um, my model used basic statistics, your points per game, your field goals per game, your field goal attempts per game, all your percentages to help reach an estimated tournament wins number based off the prior years. A few disclaimers before we get into it. Um, COVID-19 happened. Um, and unfortunately, it happened right in the middle of the conference tournaments, which I had already started compiling a lot of my data before the conference, uh, before this all happened. And conference tournaments ended up having a lot of um, significance when it came to how well a team did in the tournament. So unfortunately, I have to try and pick this year's winner without that. Um, I would also like to say that these statistics come directly from sportsreference.com. They're not my stats. I'm not going to claim it. Uh, there's a nice little Get Excel workbook feature that helped turn this project into an 80-hour project rather than a 300-hour project. Um, I would like to say that interpretations of this data are mine. Am I alone? The uh, tournaments, not the conference tournaments, but the March Madness tournaments from the previous three years are not included because obviously I don't have I'm attempting to predict the winner without the tournament having happened. So it would be kind of counterintuitive to use how these teams actually played in the tournaments to pick a tournament winner. Um, a few issues also come with the March Madness bracket layout. Uh, there's this thing called the first four where there are playing games for the 16 seeds and 11 seeds. And they vary from region to region. Um, I would have ideally predicted some of the success of teams using how well they did in regions or how well each region did with respect to uh, making the championship, winning the championship. But when they didn't release a bracket, I don't know who's in what region. So I ended up having to just use a list of teams and get an estimated win number. Uh, I would also like to say that the 68 teams were chosen by me. Once again, I had some help. I used ESPN's bubble watch and Joe Lenardi, um, he fills out his own bracket. And because he's predicted all 68 teams correctly multiple times, I feel like it would be okay to uh, go, with his, go with him on this one. Uh, also, just to appease John Will and Heather Vaccaro, I included Alabama in the statistics. Uh, obviously, when you're dealing with teams that probably only would have made the playing game, they're not going to win. So it does no harm in them being there. <laughs> uh, 
after running multiple regressions, I ran into a lot of the same contenders. I would like to mention that my first regression was using purely offensive statistics. My second was using defensive statistics. Then I started to take some of the ones that were significant and bunch them together and combine them and uh, see what would work. I decided to start switching totals and per game totals with per game differentials. So that way I could include how they were doing on defense and how they were doing on offense in one statistic. And I, apparently somewhere along the line, I kept getting the four same teams over and over and not quite in the same order, but I was able to narrow down who the contenders were. First contender is the Baylor Bears of the Big 12 Conference. They are having a great season by their standards. They have only lost uh, four games, I believe, going into their conference tournament, and they were number one for multiple weeks. Next is Duke, perennial powerhouse. Uh, Crystal Dove would be smiling if she were in here right now. And lastly is another blue blood, Kansas Jayhawks. Regularly a good team, same conference as Baylor. But I was able to get enough consistent results that I was able to uh, eliminate teams. The first team to go was the Duke Blue Devils. Crystal Dove's smile has now become a frown. Uh, Duke struggled mainly on the defensive end of things, and they were the only team out of these four to regularly fall out of the top four. They never fell below six, but they were pretty commonly five or six in my models that I ran. The next team to go is the Baylor Bears. The Baylor Bears were actually predicted the winner in one of the models, but they were also never second and were usually third or fourth. The most consistent team in second place was the Kansas Jayhawks. They are the current number one team in the country. And part of me feels happy that along with all of this madness, the number one team isn't winning because we all know the number one team never wins. Um, so a lot of you are probably wondering who that last team is. Um, I would ask that you guys give your guesses, but it, we're not in a classroom setting. So unfortunately, I'm just going to go. The winner is the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Now, as a uh, Georgia fan, my uh, bias is uh, not present in this. Obviously, Georgia is a terrible team, but uh, another Bulldogs team won, so I guess I can smile about something today. Um, a few of my observations were that defense does not win championships, at least not in the year 2020. Uh, the defensive regression was the only one that had four completely different teams. And it, they were teams that normally would have rated lower in the tournament, teams that probably would have fallen in the uh, 15 or 16 seed range. Now, that could have been a problem with my statistics, but I ran a couple other models that were similar and kept getting similar wonky results. Uh, the Blue Bloods, the teams that are usually there, uh, were there once again. And I think that usually those teams get picked a lot, and a lot of people would be very happy with the results this year. Uh, regular season success is equal to postseason success in that Baylor and Kansas and Gonzaga have the most wins out of anybody this year, other than, other than Dayton and San Diego State. So my model placed a lot of emphasis on wins, regular season wins in particular. Uh, I noticed in terms of statistical significance that a lot of the individual stats weren't very relevant. Uh, a few of the weirdly relevant ones were offensive rebounds. Uh, teams that rebound, <laughs> teams that got their own rebound and got extra shots ended up doing well, which is weird because field goal attempts didn't have too much to do with uh, tournament success. And lastly, my model was oddly favorable to mid-level conferences, not to be confused with mid-majors, but a notable absence from anywhere near the top of my list was the Big Ten Conference. The Big Ten Conference was also the, the conference that had the most teams in it per my 
my the Seth selection committee method. Uh, two teams from the Big 12 got in, a team that a conference that doesn't have very many teams getting in. Uh, the ACC is not as strong as it usually is with North Carolina being rough to say the least. So Duke got in because of that and Gonzaga plays in a mid-major conference. And there's a lot of room for improvement. A lot of my model left things unexplained, uh, which is the beauty of sports. Statistics don't explain everything. Statistics don't always explain. I kept having low numbers, probably 40 to 50% was explained by pure statistics alone. And so that opens the question to what other variables would I use? Um, because this model was so highly dependent on statistical dominance, teams like Gonzaga in these mid-major conferences where a perennial powerhouse plays against teams like Loyola Marymount and gets to win 100 to 50 every game had a lot more influence than a team that plays a lot of other good teams. Obviously, a team in the Big Ten is constantly playing other tournament contenders, and so that would dilute stats. Obviously, if you're playing against a good defense, you're not going to score as high as you normally do, uh, and so on stuff like that. That's why a team like Gonzaga or a team like Kansas or Baylor who play in weaker conferences were able to dominate so much. Uh, a lot of variables were omitted. A lot of things that with continued research I would add, such I would ideally shift away from a panel regression towards a Logit model um, so I could include stuff like home and away statistics and I could shift in towards uh, wins against March Madness teams. Uh, I would like to look at coaching tenure, things like that. I Ideally, the one that I'm saddest about not including or not being able to include in this instance is overall team experience. Because a lot of times in the tournament, a team that wins is the team that has seniors. And teams like Duke and Kentucky, sometimes they win, but a lot of times they fall short because they're a bunch of freshmen. Notice why um, using the model, I went back and predicted 2019, and it had Duke winning by a landslide, because obviously when you have two of the top three recruits in the country, your team's going to be pretty statistically dominant. But obviously that year they didn't win, it ended up being Virginia, a team that had a lot of senior leadership. So there is room for improvement in my model. A lot of real world issues got into the ways, uh, such as not being able to look at regions and proximity to the uh, to the school, uh, the higher seeds get to play in the region closest to home. That's why when Duke is the number one overall seed, they play in the East region. Or when Gonzaga is the number one overall seed, they play in the West region. So those kinds of things would have some sort of an effect. But the beauty in all of this is that it opens the door for continued research. It opens the door for uh, other observations to come in. And I'm not done researching because, well, 2021 is going to roll around and there's going to be a March Madness and I want to pick the perfect bracket. So I'll see you guys in 2021, I guess. Thank you, Seth. Um, everyone out there, uh, if you want to take a minute to discuss some virtual appreciation of a thumbs up or the golf club, uh, excellent job, great presentation. Um, and we will open it up to some questions. Uh, first one came from our own uh, Dr. Gibson. Uh, if you, if the, um, and I'm modifying it a little bit, if you'll forgive me, but um, if the NCAA had released the bracket, uh, how would you have run your model differently? I would have run it largely the same. I would have gotten a list of estimated tournament wins um, and then kind of ranked them. Sometimes I, I would have I would have used the bracket and it might have changed some things like some like Jordan said in his sometimes good teams run into good teams and that allows a worse team to get a little bit farther. So it might have changed. Uh, the only thing that would have changed is I would have picked an entire bracket rather than just a winner. Um, I have another question from John Will. Uh, if in, in all of your regression results, uh, if you had to pick a Cinderella team to make it deep, uh, which one would it be? 
uh, this is where I'd ask for a drum roll. Uh, the uh, answer is actually ETSU. Ah. Local flavor. Uh, wow. Um, and that made me very happy because I've been regularly telling people that I have ETSU in the Sweet 16, um, no matter who they play. Uh, I watched them play LSU. I actually watched them play Milligan. That game was ugly. Uh, but yeah, ETSU actually placed above Duke in one of the regressions. And I could say that it was an error in my model, but I'm going to choose to say that ETSU is just good. It's always good to favor the home the hometown team, um, at least one of the hometown players. Um, another question from uh, Patrick Gibson: um, In running the uh, in using the games for the statistics uh, from the season, did you include any sort of weight uh, for games that were closer to the end of the season versus uh, games that were towards the beginning? Um. I mostly used a weight for whether or not they played another team that was in my projected field of 68. Um, and most of those teams, especially in Power 5 conferences, were played at the end of the season. Uh, like when Duke has to play Carolina, followed by Virginia, followed by uh, Florida State. Uh, so I did not, but a lot of that weight ended up happening naturally. And yes, defense did win a championship in 2019. All right. Are there any other questions out there for Sam? All right. Let's give uh, Seth one more round of appreciation um, for a job well done. Excellent job, sir. Um, and I want to just take a minute to thank. Uh, you know, we've been thanking our presenters a lot. Uh, presenters want to take a moment to thank our audience for logging in and uh, uh, being willing to listen to our research and ask us questions. So the audience is on the top end. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Um, I think that does it for this session. Uh, there's plenty of other really good sessions. In particular, there's a great one called The Wealth of Nations, the causes and founders of economic growth. <laughs> uh, Dr. Greer got that reference. Uh, um, that was coming up at 520, so if you want to pop back into the schedule, uh, we have a couple of economic principles in there for getting some more research. Um, but again, thank you all. Thank you all for logging on and being uh, a great audience for the presenters. Really, uh, everybody was very supportive and uh, 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 really appreciated the time and excellent job uh, in finishing this. So um, thanks, everyone. Um, Happy Thursday to you.